other ideas on what I'm telling you? Our body has to make decisions on what kind of be. Our body's got to make a decision on which capillary beds to feed. How does it do that? If it's cold, your body's going to feed enter, then that leaves less circulation to like your fingers. And if it's warm, you're going to get more outspread. How else? A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you think of another reason why the body would decide which capillary beds to feed? What does it? Which ones are using? Which ones you're using? It will actually shunt blood. The way that it does that, at this teeniest, tiniest, smallest of parts, these precap um, precapillary sphincters are smooth muscle. And they are controlling at that teeny tiniest of the levels, the blood flow. Is that not cool? It can actually make the blood go to more active tissues. So, big to medium to very, very small. All right? This being our arterial, our capillary bed, okay, look at how it works. Going from the smallest to even small, 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 smaller, we end up with these little wrapping arounds of smooth muscle. And they can do this number. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Arteries meet the veins. What do you notice about those? Do what? There is no smooth muscle. At this point, pressure should be zero and it should just flow into the veins. And then we start at the small, go to medium, go to big, go back to the heart. And those tissues that would be around here, this is the area they get fed. Does that make sense? Now, in arteries, we do find that we can have something that's not very good, <coughs> an aneurysm. Ever known somebody who's had an aneurysm? All right. Certain ones, to survive them, is a miracle. Okay? Most of the time, you know, surviving an aneurysm is not something you hear. It's a weak point in that artery, that vessel wall. If we look at the structure, and if there are three layers, basically what happens with the aneurysm, it separates those layers, okay? And blood pools in between the layers. And it makes that vessel wall weak. And over time, depending on the pressure, that's coming through it, it may do okay, but then as it stretches and stretches and stretches, chances are it's gonna burst. So people who get diagnosed with them, they usually have to keep them watch, okay? And then if you suffer one and survive, they're gonna keep watching you to see, you know, if any other ones develop. Hypertension, high blood pressure, is a major cause. 
in the arteries, we're going to have sense organs. And it doesn't mean like making sense. Okay, what do we mean by the sense organs? Like the senses. Okay. <clears throat> These are going to be structures. They're going to be in the walls of the major vessels. They're monitoring blood pressure and chemistry. What did we say the chemistry was the other day? pH? Gases. All right? <coughs> pH and gases. They need to transmit information from the blood vessels. They need to transmit information so that the body, that primitive area, which is where? Brain stem. <coughs> to regulate the heart rate, the diameter of those blood vessels, and respiration. We haven't talked about that chapter yet. How many times now has it come up in the last two chapters? At least five, right? Keep that in mind, all right? We have carotid sinuses. Carotid goes where? Leads up to the brain. We have some varro receptors. They're in the wall. They want to monitor that blood pressure, send the signals, and help us monitor and maintain the blood pressure for homeostasis. We have the chemo receptors, once again, the ones for pH and the gases. They want to monitor the blood chemistry. The one thing that the body is going to do, the body is going to monitor pH and the gases very closely. It will not allow but just a minor, minor, minor change and it wants to correct it through that negative feedback. Aortic bodies, these are in the actual arch of the aorta and they're doing the same thing. <coughs> Just using a different way to transmit the information. <coughs> the capillaries, where the stuff happens. <coughs> Excuse me. With the capillaries, like it says, the business end. Now, the endothelium <coughs> is going to be very interesting. We've got three types of capillaries. Continuous, fenestrated sinusoids because it depends on which part of the body we're looking at. A continuous capillary, what you find in most of the tissues. Do you remember this term right here? The tight junctions? Because look at my structure, okay? When I'm at the capillary level, single layer of the squamous cells, all right? They're going to have their tight junctions to hold them together, but we have the ability to pass materials. For example, 
glucose. Glucose, we know, is needed in certain areas of the body. Where is an area of the body that majorly needs its glucose? The brain. The brain. Okay? Pericytes. <laughs> Peri, around. Cells that are around it, they're going to have contractile proteins, just like muscle. So when we're at the single, the single layer that doesn't have any of the control by the smooth muscle, we still need those capillaries to have the ability to do this a little bit, those cells are going to help do that. What do you notice about this structure right here? Hmm? This single layer. And what are they trying to represent being right in the middle of that layer, that, that vessel? A red blood cell. Is that red blood cell nice and round like the donut? Because at this point, when we're at the capillaries, the vessel is so small, red blood cells can only flow through one at a time. Think about that. I start out here, and I got a whole deck just full vessel that has to go from large <coughs> to medium to the small in these capillary beds at the point where the blood going through at the capillary is only going through one cell at a time. One red blood cell. And not only that, it's getting squeezed as it goes through. The poor little red blood cell. Why? Okay, well, it's, that's, it's got to go through. What is my red blood cell carrying? And that oxygen is mostly stuck to what? The hemoglobin. Guess what? you got to make it let go. So guess what happens as that, that red blood cell squeezes through that capillary? It squeezes it off. And that red blood cell has to be like, uh-uh, no, no, no. And then it's like, oh, man. And you got the oxygen to the tissues. And then, if needed, as the stuff is moving into the capillaries from the tissues, it can pick up CO2, but the majority of that's going to be just carried in the blood with the bicarb ion. <coughs> And then that red blood cell gets to go back to be in a nice little donut shape as it continues to make the circuit. How many days does the red blood cell last? About 120. This is why it's a lot of strain on that little red blood cell getting squeezed in all those capillary beds. Isn't that cool? See, told you you wouldn't think about your blood the same. The fenestrated capillaries. When something has fenestrate, when you hear that term, that means gaps. Okay? The fenestrated, find these in the kidneys, the small intestines, Something where we need to have 
rapid absorption or filtration. Basically, there's a bunch of pores, the fenestrae, that are present. You begin to look at the structure. Once again, one cell layer thick, trying to represent my little red blood cell, okay? They're showing me some of the membrane. <coughs> They're showing me the cell, okay? And in between some of these cells, they're trying to represent for me a pore. Pretty big, right? Kidneys, small intestines. What's happening in my kidneys? That blood is pouring through it quickly. Quickly. 